This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, it's time for another Virology 101. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and across the desk from me is the handsome Dick Dixon de Pommier. <laughs> Thanks for that plug, Vince. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm not a comedian, you know. He's, he's not wearing his glasses. I just wanted everybody <laughs> to know that he's he's got his glasses off. How are you, Dick? Um, chipper, but I'm a little bit throaty. I'm uh, recovering from some kind of a bug. Uh, this show will air in January of 2010. Wow. Which At which time Dixon will be in Argentina. Looking, See. looking for new viruses, no doubt. <laughs> Hardly. I hear it's summer there at the moment. It's their equivalent to July here. Why Why would you go there in the middle of winter? Well, there are these swimming things we call trout. Oh, you're going to fish? Oh. That's the whole point. That's part of it. The other part is to look at glaciers before they all disappear. They have glaciers and, uh, in Argentina? They have tons of them. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, if you go down far, far enough south, there's a whole glacier area. Are you going to photograph? You bet. Okay. Oh, yeah, sure. We look forward to seeing the results of that. By the way, there's a connection between today's topic and fly fishing, which we will get to. Well, you, sh you should point it out. Uh, that's great. This is Virology 101 Continued. And let me just... So we've done a, a number of episodes on classification, structure, entry. We did RNA synthesis last time. We did. And in case listeners are wondering where this is headed... We're going to, in the next in 2010, the next year, go through all the steps of the replication cycle, and then we'll start looking at pathogenesis. Or budding. We have to do budding. We will do assembly, exodus. absolutely, exit. We will do pathogenesis, immune responses. We'll do antivirals and vaccines, and that should bring us through the fall. Wow. And then we'll start doing individual viruses. Wonderful. And that'll take us on for years and years. I think. All right. Absolutely. And so in your retirement, you will continue to teach and learn. I didn't retire. I just changed jobs. <laughs> you know what I did this past? I shouldn't. Hey, this is TWIV. I got confused. That, that, that's okay, Vince. <laughs> I did an influenza plaque assay this week. Uh -huh. The first since I was a graduate student. Did it, it work out it right? It worked, yeah. Really? I, I plaqued out. I, I pulled a vial. This is actually funny. It's a 1930-ish uh, H1N1 strain, which I'd had in my freezer since I was a student. I brought it with me all over. We don't. I pulled it out. <coughs> We're going to have that. No problem. Do you have a uh, common cold or influenza? I believe it's a common cold. Just I get focus these. in the upper tract. No, uh, it's pretty far down, actually. It's, it's, it's down in the lumbar region, but um, it's a typical winter thing for me. I get one of these every other year. Okay. Anyway, so it was uh, an old vial. I put it in cells. It grew. I plaqued it. It's high titer. It's amazing. They last a long time. <sighs> but of course, it's in a minus 70 centigrade freezer. Still. Do you, do you store parasites at minus 70? You can. Did, was it necessary to keep them for long periods? Um, it, it, sure. I mean, if you want to work with them in the lab and you want them available at all times without having to maintain them in, in uh, their mammalian hosts. You store them. Yeah, that's what we do with viruses. And, of course, cells we freeze even lower. But the parasites being multicellular or at least unicellular, you have to protect against ice crystal formation. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of agents that you have to use with them. Same with eukaryotic cells. You have yeah, to yeah. put... Uh, that's right. We use DMSO, yep. uh, 10%, I think. Right. All right, let's get on to today, Virology 101. What I wanted to talk about today is, is sort of an extension of last time. Last time we talked about RNA synthesis in mm -hmm. cells infected with RNA viruses. Correct. And that was going from RNA to RNA. Here we have a group of viruses that go from RNA to DNA. Hmm. More as we'll see. So it was sort of a reverse. <laughs> <laughs> reverse what? Transcription. Exactly. <laughs> Do you know when this story actually... So we're going to talk about reverse transcription today. Do you know when this story, modern times, begins? Not modern, but when does it begin, virologically speaking? I don't have a clue. In the early 1900s, the first uh, cancer viruses were discovered. Hmm. 1908, chicken sure. leukemia virus sure, 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 sure. by Bang and another individual whose name is escaping me. And the 1911, Rouse sarcoma right. virus. I saw the original tumor, by the way. You did? I did. Was I was at Rockefeller for three years, and there was a guy there studying with Rouse mm -hmm. the year I got there. And he said, do you want to see the original chicken tumor that the New Jersey chicken farmer brought to us? I said, sure. And he showed me the pathological slide with the tumor on it. 
Wow, they preserved it. Oh, it's a slide. It's okay. a slide. So yes, what he did was take a tumor, grind it up, and, and filter it through a 0.2 micron filter. Right. And the viruses would go through all the bacteria and cells. Would it be was removed. a filterable agent. It was a filterable agent. He injected it into chickens and showed that they gave them sarcomas, which is a solid, a type of solid tumor. Yes. And so that that was those were the first. There was also one a few years earlier that caused leukemia in chickens, which is of course a cancer of the the white blood cells. Right. And those were the first tumor viruses. So they were called tumor viruses. Then there was a mammary tumor virus too, right? Yes, then mammary Charlotte tumor Friend. virus and, and mice and many others over the years. Yep. But never, not for a long time, human ones. But we'll get to that in another show. Sure. Then when we understood that these viruses that had RNA in them, we called them RNA tumor viruses. Right. Now, this brings us to the early 70s mm -hmm. when two different investigators were trying to understand how these viruses worked. There was some evidence that these, the genetic information of these RNA tumor viruses became a permanent part of the cell. Huh. And Howard Temin at the University of Wisconsin and David Baltimore, right. who at the time was at MIT, Temin actually proposed that the RNA became integrated into the host DNA in a DNA form. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right. Quite mysterious. Very different. And so there was actually some precedent for that. Do you know what that might be? From no. the world of bacteria. Ah, okay. Plasmids. Lambda DNA. Okay. Integrating into the host okay. DNA. So, in fact, Alan Campbell was essential in this line of work. He showed genetically that the phage DNA of bacteriophage lambda, this is a virus that infects bacteria, it's a linear double-stranded DNA. It can at times circularize, you can see here in this right, next picture. Right. And then that will integrate by a specific site into the bacterial chromosome. Somebody made here. a lot of money on that. <laughs> Is that true? That was one of the vehicles for getting well, other pieces of DNA sure. into the uh, genome. So this goes into bacterial DNA. This was done, this was shown genetically. Not biochemically, Got it. not by cloning, right. just by genetic. Right. And in fact, we talked about this with Lynn Enquist a few, a number of twibs ago. Uh -huh. you might want to take a look at that. And so Temin said, hmm, there is precedent in bacteria for integration. He said, I bet that these tumor viruses, these RNA tumor viruses, make a DNA copy and then they integrate. Sounds reasonable. Cell. Okay, so he tried to show the presence of tumor virus DNA in, in the host cell DNA, and that was really hard to do. Okay. To make sure that it, you don't have any remnant virus particles. See, nowadays we could just sequence it. We'd find it. Yeah, there. that's right. That's right. But back then they were using techniques involving radioactivity and hybridization. Very difficult to. And do what on it. sucrose gradients or cesium chloride gradients? Um, to, I don't even remember what they were doing. Right. But they couldn't get good evidence for it. And yeah. then he and Baltimore at the same time had the idea that there must be an enzyme in the virion that converts the tumor virus RNA into DNA. Hmm. So they looked for it. Now, if you remember last time, we were talking about David Baltimore's early work with RNA viruses. He right. would infect cells, crack them open, yep. add radioactive precursors, and show that RNA was made. Right. So he said, hmm, I could use the same technology, take RNA tumor virions, crack them open, add the precursors to DNA synthesis, which would be ATP, TTP, CTP, and GTP, the nucleoside, deoxyribonucleoside triphosphates, and look for incorporation into radioactive material. So he and Temin had this idea at 